This morning what I want to do is talk about the Postal Service. Give you some background about the, the mailing business, the postal business, and it's kind of sort of tell you where we are and how we got here. This picture up here really kind of tells it all. If you've been in the, in the, in the trade at all for the, for the past few years and paying attention, you know that the world has changed. Looking at the left-hand side of the chart up here, you can see how things were back in 2007, and over there on the right-hand side, how things are or were in 2012. It was a major change for uh, an institution that had gone along fat, dumb, and happy for, for decades, for centuries. Volume dropped, revenue dropped, and of course, unfortunately, expenses did not drop as much as they should have. And this chart not only captures the, 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 the problem that afflicted the postal service and the industry, but also really gives you an insight into one of the fundamental economic problems that's affecting the postal service that is underlying the problems it has today. Look up here for some more numbers. You can see that over the course of, of seven years, things really, really changed. You had a dramatic drop in volume, a dramatic drop in revenue, and you went from being an institution with no debt to one that was $15 billion in the hole and digging further. So right now, that's the direction that they are continuing to go in, not quite as fast, perhaps, but still the direction they're going to. Uh, they, they, they're still losing money after, despite a series of rate cases. So clearly, if you're a business person with a business head, you can see this is not a healthy organization, one that has some fundamental problems and challenges in its business model. Clearly, the need to have overnight service for first-class mail has diminished. The Postal Service figured that why do we support a network designed to enable service at this pace if people are no longer using it? So the Postal Service has, is in the process of a two-phase change to virtually eliminate overnight service for first-class mail. Keep it just about within the service area of the plant where it's processed. What this is going to do, of course, is help them save costs by load leveling. If you run an operation of some sort, you know, it's very inefficient to have all your resources pegged towards a small window of activity and have those resources then sit around, if you will, the rest of the day. Having, having, uh, that's why the Postal Service and FedEx and UPS cooperate a lot on air transportation. Because FedEx and UPS realize we have to have all these aircraft to uh, handle our, our peak volume, back and forth to Memphis, back and forth to Louisville, whatever, and otherwise they sit around. So by contracting with the Postal Service, they can find activities for the pilots, for the crews, for the aircraft off hours. The same thing is happening here. The Postal Service's processing day is now being spread over 20 hours instead of over eight because they no longer have to meet this service commitment. Now there's also the possibility as a result of, 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 of changing the network. Uh, the NDCs, the bulk mail centers were changed a few years ago, they were retasked. Those are the big plants, there's one over here in Egan. Uh, and that was changed a few years ago, as I said. Now they're going through the downsizing of their, of their infrastructure. If you've got too many factories, if you've got too many plants, you've got too many buildings and too many people, what would you do as a business person? Right? I don't need all of this, why do I have it? And what the Postal Service is doing right now is going through that very same process. They have to do it under the bubble of congressional scrutiny. They have to do it with a lot of union pressure. They have to do it with a lot of public input on what they can do to maintain certain levels of activity. Just the same, they are going through this whole thing, essentially reducing their physical network of processing plants by half. Going from over 500, about 500, 460 or so, a few years ago, down to about 220 before we get finished here. Uh, they'll, they'll finish the last, the last part of this next spring, but at the end of the day, they hope to save themselves about $3.7 billion in annual operating costs and reducing complement consider considerably along the way. This little, all the little dots up here show you kind of where plants were two years ago, three years ago. And this next picture shows you how many fewer dots are going to be in the, in, in the future when they get all finished this process. Now obviously what this means is by eliminating the overnight commitment, now they can travel farther to get mail to bring it back to a processing plant that's now more efficiently operated because they don't have to return that mail back out to Podunk overnight. So if you're in a place like, I'm going to walk in front of you again. If you're in play, a place like, you know, Salt Lake City or Las Vegas or Phoenix or, or, or Albuquerque, now your geographic reach, the trucks go out a long way to get mail. But they also don't have to hurry back the next, the, before the next morning to bring it back again. So this is the efficiency gained by changing service standards. 
This is not something simple to do. If any of you have gone through IMB implementation already, it's not simple. Full service is not just click, it's on. No such thing. So we're very concerned about that. The industry is also concerned about access to, to some key individuals who advise about mail piece design. We're concerned about changes in, in, the, in, in the infrastructure. And we're concerned about something called seamless acceptance, which is sort of a cousin to full service. And it's a process by which the, the Postal Service hopes to eliminate a lot of the physical verification of mail. No longer the clerk down there whiffling through pieces, counting and putting 10 on the scale, weighing them, look, checking a random tray, blah, blah, blah. Get rid of all of that because you will find, they will finally realize that the machines they paid so much money for out on the floor out there can count really, really well. And they can figure out whether or not the pre-sort's correct, whether the number of trays is correct, whether all this other stuff. But let's tie this back now to full service. If there is one thing full service calls for, it is exceptional quality. Operationally, it used to be, you know, you're, you're producing mail on the floor and the machine burps and pieces of mail fly out and whatever. You redo them or something, you put them wherever they go. And, the, you know, there was, no, there was no obsession, if you will, over accuracy and quality. But when you get into full service, it has to be obsessive. There needs to be accuracy in the data because everything ties together. When this tray that you produced, that you put a barcoded label on, goes on a pallet, goes on a truck, goes down the road to Wichita, gets taken off, gets barcode scanned, there better be the right number of pieces in that, in that tray that we're expecting because the machine's going to count them. And the machine knows because the great mothership in the sky told it what's supposed to be on that pallet in that tray. And if those pieces aren't there, the little red light goes on and the phone rings. So the idea is that full service being driven by data requires extraordinary accuracy in data, requires extraordinary quality control and production because all these things have to tie together. So if you don't know how to do that, you've got to go back and read that chapter over again. Another challenge that we face as an industry is there used to be a time when the Postal Service would talk to us and say, we would like to engage in the kind of work relationship with you in which we achieve what they called the lowest combined costs. And that is, if it's low for you and it's low for me and we can find out so we can get it at the right mix so that the costs are at their absolute lowest, we come out ahead. In recent years, however, that philosophy has seemed to drift aside. And what you're beginning to see is the Postal Service intensify the requirements that it wants to place on mailers in order to be able to qualify for some of the more favorable rates that it has. And it's passing along this obligation with little thought or concern about how the costs are now actually being borne by the mailing industry. And this is likely to be a trend that has a probability of continuing, in part because as you're looking at a postal system that is undergoing a great deal of change, it is struggling to figure out itself where it's going within the future what the future is going to be for it, how it can retain a sense of viability and importance within American society while still meeting the needs of those whose businesses are closely tied to the idea of a universal uh, postal delivery system. The first thing it would do is it would gut whatever protection you have as a market dominant male user from abuses under current postal law because it takes away from the Postal Regulatory Commission the opportunity for you to come forward and challenge some of the things that the Postal Service would like to do. Now, it, the Postal Service is a governmental institution and it's run by a governmental bureaucracy. People respond to the incentives that are set in front of them. If I give you a set of incentives that allow you to do whatever the hell you want and get away with it, what are you going to do? I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. I'm going to get, try to get away with it. So you need to make sure that the incentives are set in a way so that it causes people to behave in a manner that you would find would be successful or uh, 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 valuable to you. If you take a look at Section uh, 301, there is absolutely no protection that's afforded you due to the fact the Postal Service has a monopoly. In other words, Section 301 would take away entirely any rate-making authority of the Postal Regulatory Commission, give it solely to the Postal Service and the Board of Governors, and would empower them to be able to set rates any way they want, any time they want, 
for whatever reason that they may have there. If Section 301 goes through, now you need to understand, I'm 67, I've agreed to work for Postcom for three more years, at 70, I retire. If Section 301 goes through, I'm going to be gone. My retirement money is all set, all ready. I'm going to be on easy street. You're going to be the poor bastards that are going to have to live within the environment that Section 301 would take. Okay, I'm telling you for sure, not as a lobbyist or as an advocate, I'm telling you for sure, if it goes through, the 7.5 million jobs that are part of this industry are at great risk. And these are the people who live off of the food chain that's all associated with communicating and doing business by printed matter through the mail. Many of the businesses that would be involved in this industry would be gone in a flash. Many catalogs would not have the capability of distributing their printed matter at a reasonably enough uh, affordable rate to be able to stay in business. Those businesses would evaporate. As businesses that use paper evaporate, people who are in the printing industry suffer. As mail volume goes down, software vendors suffer. So we're looking at something that can have a very, very significant impact on the industry. <clears throat> so now that you know about it, what do I want you to do? <coughs> there is a senator <coughs> from Wisconsin who has heard us talk about this, and she has taken it very, very seriously. The fact that you've got a several major printers within her home state, that kind of helps. <coughs> but she has recognized that Section 301 of the proposed bill would be anathema. And she is taking on an effort on her own with her colleagues that also joined in and supported with her on making sure that when this thing comes up for markup next week, Section 301 is stricken from the bill. Now, I need you to do something. And that is, they're trying to get a list of as many companies as they can to indicate that they support Senator Baldwin's efforts to have this stricken from the bill. This is a real simple task. All you need to do is to send an email to that address that has this message in it. I support Senator Baldwin's efforts to strike Section 301 from the bill. Now, the slides I'm giving um, today <clears throat> are already posted up on the Postcom website. So if for some reason or another you've got to go back to your business and explain to your boss why it's important that the company's name needs to be on it, I want you to be able to download the slides so that you can begin to take a look at it and say, this is the information I want to share with you. And you can get those slides by going to postcom.org forward slash satori.pdf. You'll download them. You'll be able to share that information with others that are there. And you'll play a major role in helping to stop a proposal that, trust me, would put a lot of people in this room out of business. Postal is, has so many associations with so many special interest groups that you know, one of the things that we hear when we go out to the Hill is industry folks in this room, we do not have unified lists. Periodicals want this. Flat mailers want this. First class mailers want this. Packages don't, you know, so-and-so wants this. Pharmaceuticals don't want to go to buy that. You know, I mean, so there's no consistent message from the industry. Where the unions, they say, we want these five things. Every time, every district, everywhere, nonstop. So it's, a, it's a hard. It's hard um, in the political climate today that to, to go up there and say, we want X, because you know what they'll say? Because the, the people who do postal are the ones who've always been doing postal. Yeah, but you know, some of them were just in here yesterday and told me this. That's completely what I said. So which is it? So I think a consistency from an industry perspective really needs to be pursued. There's a huge discussion on load leveling, and just a quick background on that. Load leveling is postal services saying, we're getting too much mail on Friday. 
an injury that's losing money, but they get too much mail on Friday. And we can't handle that because we have so much overtime invested on Friday. We want to smooth it out. So there is a work group at MTAC, but one of the main thing, one of the main things coming through is like saying, for example, standard down by. What if you don't count Sunday, Sunday as a work day? So in other words, they won't touch standard down box on that day. So what happens? If you still want an in-home date of Monday or Tuesday, you have to enter your mail date earlier. So instead of being on Friday, moving it down and on Thursday, therefore decreasing the overtime and handling and all of that stuff. So there are different initiatives being put forth and moving around, not counting certain days of the week. So, you know, industry would kind of have to absorb that and go from there. There's also a flash strategy document. Do you see on that? Yeah, I have it. Yeah. Yes. Bob and I both sit on that, um, on this crazy thing of um, strategy document. I'm sure folks that are strategy in the room will laugh. It's like an operational plan, but that's what it is right now. And so the Postal Service is work, working with industry, in other words, hearing our suggestions, not even not doing anything about it, to go through and put forth the document where they hope to drive uh, some of the initiatives over the next couple of years to that ERC mandate that they have. If you're doing carry route mail today, you're going to see a significant reduction in the number of bundles that you're creating because instead of, you know, in periodicals you got six and in standard you got your 10 or 15 piece minimum. Here what's going to happen is you, you're going to end up throwing all of those together into a single bundle. So when you look in that bundle, you can have one of seven possible rates. You're either going to, and so within a, within a bundle you could have high density plus, High density, carrier route basic, five digit automation, five digit pre sorted, three digit automation, and three digit pre sorted. So, in today's world, if you're using the optional prep that exists today, there's only five possible rates in that bundle. And the two that were excluded were the three digit pre sorted and three digit automation. And the reason for that is, is in today's world, the Postal Service said, you first had to meet your six piece or 10 piece for a carrier route or for a five digit before you could put it into the bundle. So you had to kind of pre-qualify it first based on the number of pieces. And in the, in the optional prep that's coming in January, what the Postal Service really wants is to say, I want every single piece for that zip code in those bundles going to that machine, regardless of if you've hit the 10 piece minimum or six piece minimum or not. So when you don't, Ha hit one of those minimums to qualify for a rate, the default rate will then become the three-digit pre-sorted or three-digit automation rate. So one of the th interesting things there is, is the Postal Service has said that um, as long as you hit three inches of mail, you can make this bundle. Mail.dat 14-1 goes into effect in January. There are going to be some things that are coming in January that are going to require you to move from Mail.dat 13-1 current to mail that debt 14-1 you know, in January. For example, there's a new single piece rate that, for first class mail. That's going to require it. There's a few other things. So one of the things you need to start planning for is moving to 14-1 in January. The other thing that's going on is 14-2 coming out in July with the next Pulse to One release in the summer is going to, one of the things we're working on is We've done a whole bunch of house cleaning in mail.dat. We've been adding stuff to that specification for years and years and years. We've never gone back around to take a look at, well, what stuff's not being used anymore that we can get rid of? And so we've been currently right now going through this huge house cleaning and getting rid of a bunch of stuff. And just a specific example is the PDR record, which is piece level detail. We've been able to remove 24% of, of the file and make it significantly smaller. So one of the things that we're doing is shrinking the mail.dat record size, getting rid of noise and unused values, unused fields, so it's just going to be easier to understand. It's not going to be as big and bulky, and it's going to be a little bit more lean version of mail.dat, which will hopefully allow it to you know, transmit, upload more quickly, and just be a little bit, you know, not have all the noise and complexity of th that exists today. So there's a, a, a big house cleaning event that we did. Um, we talked full service invoicing already in the general session, so I'm not going to touch on that anymore. The other thing that was looking like it was going to be coming in July of 2014 was the Postal Service was, is looking at expanding mixed class co-mail. Mixed class co-mail is combining standard mail flats with periodical flats in a mailing to basically give you better density, better penetration. They're looking at expanding it to include bound printed matter as well. 
They were looking at it for July. Apparently, generating three different postage statements out of Postal 1 is creating a little bit more complexity than they intended. And they basically said they can't make it. They're not gonna, it didn't make it into July, so now it, that's been pushed to January 2015. But when we get there, one of the things we're going to be looking for here is interest in, okay, you know, we support, pre-cert supports mixed class co-mail, periodical and standard. Expanding that into bound printed matter is going to be an opportunity there. We have a new cast cycle coming. So just to kind of give you an idea of the time frame of what's going on, official rules come out in November. They haven't come out yet, but we've had our initial meeting with the Postal Service, so we kind of got a feel of a few things that might be coming. We'll officially know towards the end of the month. Stage one testing comes out in March of 2014. Basically, stage one is a file that we can use to test against that also has the answers, the Postal Service's expected answers. So then, from a software engineering perspective, this is our, our test file or that we can use. Stage two becomes available in May. Basically, that's the window where we can, we as software providers can start do, doing our certification for CAS cycle O for the next cycle. And then, we're, vendors are going to be required to be complete by December of 2014, and then we have to have it released to customers no later than March of 2015. Now, just to bleed into this afternoon's conversation, does March 2015 sound familiar to anyone? So, um, when, it, when you talk about the end of life of ACE and the fact that, I think you can count on the fact that I don't think SAP is going to be recertifying ACE for CAS Cycle O. They're just going to kill it at the point that the software is required to be deployed. So let's talk a little bit about July. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening after all these price changes go into effect. You know, so like I said, starting on January 26th, it'll be existing, the existing verifications plus the very minor full service verifications. Now, starting in now, right away when you're doing your full service mailings today, the post office is checking a lot of stuff in your EDOC that they don't, they're not telling you about really. They're not, uh, they're not coming back to you and saying, hey, this is an error, go back and fix it. They're just kind of tallying these errors over time. And, um, and then what they're going to do is starting in July, they're going to start invoicing you if you have problems. Yay? Right? So what's going to happen is the post office is going to take each calendar month and they're going to take each EDOC submitter and they're going to take a look at all the mail that came in through that EDOC submitter for that calendar month and see how well you did on several different criteria. I've kind of simplified the list here. Uh, you can actually view all of this right now on your mailer scorecard on the Business Customer Gateway. So if you haven't already looked at your mailer scorecard, I recommend that you start looking at it because this is going to be your best friend and your best defense when there are problems. Um, it may also be your worst enemy if you continue to have problems. But basically, the post office is going to start looking at your mailing, and especially your eDoc, and checking all the information that's in it and making sure that it's right. So within a 30-day period, did you have some barcodes that were in the same barcode that went through? Because you're supposed to keep those barcodes unique for 45 days. If you had any overlap there, then that's going to be considered an error. Another thing that they're going to be taking a close look at, which we talked about in the panel, is that lovely buy for information, making sure that that's right, whatever right is, whatever that definition is, right? They actually, they actually define the mail owner and the mail preparer in the, the final rule for full, full service, but uh, it's still, there's still a lot of vagueness there because they're still so, assuming that there's only two parties that are involved in the mailing. You know, you've got the mail owner, you might have an advertising agency, you might have a printer, and the, the mail sorter, and maybe an MLOCR, or a co-mingler, or, you know, the transportation company. Who, who's the mail preparer? And it could be anybody in that entire stream. So they're going to look at the buy for information. They're going to make sure that the mail owner, CRID, is for an actual mail owner and not a mail service provider. So if you do any of your own mail, or if you want to identify yourself, as the mail owner, make sure that your CRID is set up properly in Postal 1 so that you don't get knocked over that because that will be considered an error. The other thing is if you do need co-palletization, you need to make sure that you have an OCI file that links the original pallet with the, with the co-palletized pallet. So 
to make sure all that information is linked in there as well. And then uh, also the, the mailer ID that's on the mail piece and the service type ID that's in that barcode are valid for the type of mail that you're sending. So they're going to check all of this stuff. Now the, number, the percentages that I have up here are actually preliminary percentages based on the full service mail that's in the mail stream today. What's going to happen is January 26th is going to come around. These thresholds will actually increase, so you'll have a little bit more flexibility just because those smaller mailers aren't going to be able to handle the uniqueness of, of the people who've been doing full service for a while. Their mail, their mail quality is pretty good. It's the smaller mailers that are going to have problems. So, for you, so for the mail, the EDOC submitter, all of your mails average for the calendar month, and then you get a nice invoice. Guess how you get the invoice? Don't get it in your mailbox. It's a shame. You get it in your email box. <laughs> you like that? You're that you're like, what? You're the post office. Shouldn't you want to add more mail to the mail stream? Well, their mail pro catalog went all digital as well just a couple months ago. So they are definitely living by example there. But uh, you'll, you'll get an, an email basically saying log into the business customer gateway and make sure and uh, come pay this thing. You'll have a little bit of a time to, uh, to try and contest any errors that you think uh, aren't valid. And then, uh, and then they'll go back and rule on whether they think you argued your case well enough. And either you pay or don't get dismissed. So uh, that process will be pretty short. I think you only have about 10 days to actually make your, make your case. So uh, Joe, when we were walking through the rehearsal on this, he looked at the slides and you know you should do this because you lived through it. And I said, just bear it. Uh, I made it. I made it. So the timeline obviously was uh, back in 1984, Postal Soft was founded. I came on board somewhere around right here. Uh, we obviously kept it as our Postal Vertical line. We created First Logic as our data quality uh, company, part of uh, the other prong of it, and that uh, took on that name. Uh, around, right around there, where you guys are familiar with business objects, purchased us. Okay, and as you can see, uh, uh, we did the progression of downfall all the way to where SAP bought us and bought business objects. And the reason why that goes down is uh, to a lot of us, uh, we spent many years building the brand and acquiring you guys as clients. And we're very proud of it. And I'm very proud of my time doing it. I'm even more proud of uh, the ability to work with Joe and Art to be here again to do it again. And our goal, if you get the thing, Joe, for me, is to bring it back up to where it used to be on all fronts. So here's, kind of a, here's a high overview of, of the solution for replacing the, the product. You know, you used to here, we've got your ACE job file, you've got Postal Soft Base, and you know, you've got the SAP version of the directories. We've created as a little interface product, a Turi job file add-on. So it's basically an interface reader that'll take the job file, convert it to what Satori can understand, and then we run it through our US address engine. Bully caps, up to date, lots of investment going on in this as you've heard throughout the day. But you know, literally, it's that much of a seamless uh, transition. Take your existing ACE job file, we can read it, we can use it, it runs, you know, you're good to go relatively quickly. Also, for the NTOA, you can <coughs> call it to the cloud. You don't have to put it from us. You can, you can do either. And, and incidentally, uh, for those of you that were in the uh, data append and the data enhancement, once, once you land there, you have access to the cloud. So other services, other so services. services. You yeah. assume that it's a lot easier. You get, you get, you get to some broader options than you have right now. So going forward, so if we take, you know, just from a data quality perspective, the address, data right entry parsing, match consolidate, you know, the solution that we're going to move towards is being able to replicate what you're doing there, but it will not be a direct one of all replacement. So, you know, there won't be job file readers for all the different uh, technologies like that. So we're going to be more in the process of, you know, we're well down the process of moving more towards a work flow type paradigm of the capabilities. So instead of these uh, monolithic products file in, file out, it's more of a uh, the functionality is more of a workflow mode and you can stream it through, you know, for big workflows, small workflows, whatever you want. But, you know, the idea in the, trans in the transition would be We've got licenses to the job file products ourselves, so we can, as we work with you to go through this, we can read your job files. We can make sure that we are uh, 
our technology is processing your data the same way people are used to, used to doing it, so that your data results are consistent. So, you know, again, the term we're using is replicating what you're doing. It's not, you know, again, going to be a one-to-one -one swap up, but that is our target, and that's how we're going about it. All right, so when you're looking to make a transition, you know, obviously, as you guys have probably seen already, you're under a billion dollars. SAP is going to push you into the channel. Um, if you're in the channel, most of those guys are system integrators. They're not product development companies. They're not going to, certainly not going to live in the mail industry at most level. They'll have people sitting on the commission, the board, the committees, and things like that, influencing what's going on. So you'll get a solution, but it's um, you're still then you, know, you become an SAP customer again, and you've got those support channels, and you, know, you guys know what you get when you, when you sign up for that. So and, you know, I think as you've seen with us, we're invested in the industry. We're, we're committed here. Um, I don't think we're standing up here saying that every single solitary thing that could possibly uh, come up, we've already resolved. But we're sitting here saying we've got some very good technology behind the scenes. I think we're going to be able to meet your needs. Um, we want to work with you. And you know, my approach going forward is not so much that you know, we're just going to fling your product, but we understand, again, back where we started, you know, with Lou 20 years, you know, working with you guys with those products, we understand how deeply embedded those are. It's not such a simple, easy task um, or trivial task, and we appreciate that. So, um, you know, our go forward here is to really work closely and, you know, again, make it as easy as possible, but collaborate and adjust what we're doing 